So for me, omni-channel is really being able to pick up where you left off at any channel at any time. So that can be very complicated, being able to keep track of what was happening in one channel, being able to transfer that information and knowledge into another channel, channel so the person can just continue going forward. You know, it's interesting. I, I think back, um, maybe it's just the vernacular, but the same theme is, is continued, right? So to mm -hmm. me, omni-channel, um, just the words were more present perhaps three, four years ago. Mm -hmm. And I feel like for, you know, a number of reasons, it's really evolved into um, digital first, mm -hmm. right? And digital being more the anchor of the experience mm -hmm. and you know, certainly this started in e-commerce, but I feel like it's proliferated from mm -hmm. there through mm -hmm. COVID and, you know, other, other, for other reasons as well. Um, so yeah, I've seen digital first, Omnichannel has been more replaced at least in, mm -hmm. you know, in my experience by digital first and the ability to have a seamless uh, online to offline experience, which is the same themes of Omnichannel. Mm -hmm. still presented in a slightly different way of, of the anchor being uh, digital. Um, mm -hmm. So that's been my experience. Um, as I say, it's really, there's a lot of continuity there. It's just, I think with, um, you know, with just the, um, I think proliferation of capabilities, many more companies are much better at digital now than they were kind of even three, four years ago. So I think yeah. it's a lot, a lot of companies to really focus on digital first and ensuring that um, there's a catchment that, you know, that, that if for whatever reason, if a customer does need to reach out, that there is, a, you know, that, that continuity. Um, but really, I do have seen digital first kind of come to the fore. Yeah. And a couple of things on that. So one piece of digital first is that there's a lot of information, right, that you can gather through the digital experience around context and what's happening, right, with that person. That's one, I think, reason why digital is, you know, digital first is, you know, getting pushed. Another piece is just, you know, opportunities to save money, right? In terms of as you start to think about creating a digital experience versus having in-person experiences and, you know, brick and mortar, right? The individuals, all of those things that add to it. So I'm just curious there in terms of, is there anything else you think that's pushing towards the digital first other than those two things that I mentioned? Um, I mean, I, I think for most, consumers, um, there's just a preference mm. towards efficiency, mm. right? I mean, I, you want a gold-plated experience and you value your time, yeah. right? So yeah. just make it easy for me, remove the barriers. Um, people live very busy lives. Um, mm -hmm. And to the extent, and for the most part, they don't want to have to interact with companies. Mm -hmm. on, a, on a basis, right? Like it's just so much easier for um, for people to be able to manage their experiences digitally. So mm -hmm. I think that it just, it is born out of, um, it's a lot um, more common, I think, for customers mm -hmm. to manage their entire end-to-end -end digitally without ever talking um, to a human being. Um, you know, you want to make sure that somebody's there when it when they don't have the experience that, that they deserve. Um, but generally, I just think, you know, just the expectation has changed or evolved. Yeah. You know? yeah. And I think the ability to deliver has evolved, right? It's yeah. just a lot more common to be able to deliver an end-to-end -end, uh, experience. And, and I think for the bottom line, it makes absolute sense too, right? Yeah. For, for yeah. the bottom line, and you think about, um, you know, virtual assistants and, you know, I, you know, I think, Five years ago, that was a novel concept, and now they're, they're <laughs> and frankly very yeah. useful now, right? Yeah. I, you know, I think people used to shudder about virtual assistants a few years back, and and now it's actually sometimes the easiest way to get things done, right? So mm -hmm. yeah, I just think the capability has changed, the expectations has continued to evolve, and uh, you know, I, I think um, you know, COVID has really focused the lens. Um, both from a consumer lens, but also businesses. I think businesses have really realized that investments here pay uh, outsized returns, right? So yeah. investments in digital and these capabilities really pay, uh, really, really drop to the bottom line very, very quickly as well. So I think from a business standpoint, it certainly makes sense as well.
yeah. And something else, just building on what you talked about preferences. So there's preferences that people have built on just the convenience of it. Like I can do it when I want, how I want, right? So that's a big piece. Efficiency in terms of like there's an opportunity to do it really quickly, not waste a bunch of time. And then the other piece that I've also seen is in terms of they just the overall experience, right? Because I can bring in things that are relevant to the situation that I know about you and can actually create a better experience. I don't need to ask questions necessarily in the digital experience because I have the history and if I can pull it properly, I can actually use that, right? To actually create a better experience for you. So it actually feels like a better experience. So that also potentially creates that preference for it. Would you agree? Yeah, exactly. I think that's right. I think that's right. I mean, yeah, I think all in, in all of our personal lives, um, certainly myself, it's so much more efficient to be able to run an end-to-end -end digital experience. You know, yeah. you have a you have a break between meetings. You can do your banking, right? <laughs> you know? And that, like, and um, and I enjoy. I appreciate that efficiency. I think everybody does, right? So yeah. I think it's about taking all of the complexity out of the experience, um, making sure that you can we can cover ever more of um, the exceptions. Right, because yeah. yeah. you know it's it's all about, um, you know, it's all about making sure that you understand where the experience is breaking down and closing yeah. those gaps, and making yeah. sure that you can continue to keep that uh, online. You can yeah. close kind of even those more difficult experiences online, and that's kind of yeah. the build over time as you get a better understanding of what's working. You fix your business processes to to make sure that you can enable the digital experience, which importantly includes simplification, right? <laughs> taking, taking a lot of that complexity out of the experience. Um, yeah. And just, I mean, it's it's far more straightforward to digitize a, a simple, you know, experience than it is um, to try to digitize a very complex, convoluted experience, right? Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned something about breakdowns and in terms of breakdowns of experiences online. And, you know, in the past, that automatically jumped to a call center. You know, and then the call center all of a sudden was getting these calls, right, to try and fix things. And that's something that, you know, continues to happen. But I think people are getting better, right, in terms of keeping it online and making things happen. So I don't know if you have any comments on that, but I, that was just a, an observation that I, I, I see, right, over the last couple of years personally. Yeah, and I think also the, the ability to... Um, provide the frontline team member, agent, mm -hmm. you know, store rep mm -hmm. with the appropriate information to yes. manage that interaction, to be yeah. informed, right? Yes. Um, yes. And manage that interaction is uh, just light years ahead of, of where it was before. Yes. Um, so I think we're getting to a place where uh, we can deliver a more seamless experience because we have a better understanding of our customer. Um, mm -hmm. We're getting a better understanding of um, when things aren't working well, um, mm -hmm. and therefore we can arm our team members kind of mm -hmm. with the tools to manage those mm -hmm. difficult conversations, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add, just that we didn't cover on the omni-channel stuff, but like to me that I, I really like what you were talking about there, the digital first, but then supported, right? Versus, hey, they're all equal. Let's try to make them all you know, at the highest level that we can, right? I feel like that's what you're saying, that there's that's been a, a bit shift, of a shift. That's away. a shift in the last three years, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Cool. You know, you, you mentioned kind of the startup and being able to um, get up and running quickly and deliver a, a digital first, uh, a seamless digital first experience end to end. And I think the barriers to doing that have come down immeasurably in the last yeah. five years. I think it is, um, you know, the in many ways, um, you know, the the path is perhaps more straightforward if you mm -hmm. have the clean slate, right? Mm -hmm. So you know, there's you you, um, you know, I, I've worked in enterprise for a long time, but I, I've mm -hmm. done stints in smaller companies, and um, I think the the resource um, pressure. Of a like a startup environment really kind of focuses you down a path where you tend to select a vendor who uh, you know can go soup to nuts, right? Mm -hmm. And you um, 
you work within that suite. You pick that suite, you light up components of that suite, and those suites are designed for seamless interactions, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's, I don't think it's limited to enterprise uh, to answer your question directly. I think within enterprise, you have very different approaches because you have, you tend to have far more resources available, um, though you also have investments that have been made over many, many years, right? So in some ways, the path to deliver that seamless end-to-end -end experience, digital first, um, is requires a lot more strategy, a lot more planning, and a lot more um, perseverance, I think. It, it just requires a multi-year um, uh, continuation, like a, multi a strategy with execution over several years. I think that's mm -hmm. that's the most important thing for an enterprise to really get behind this is to define the strategy, set up the team, set up the delivery model, um, partner with the business to make sure that um, that use cases are delivered in service to specific business priorities, high value business priorities. And then what I've seen is a very, very successful approach is lighting up those new capabilities um, in service to the business priorities so that you are on a quarterly basis demonstrating the value that you are delivering and that over time builds credibility and that over time delivers or enables a multi-year approach um, which which in, within enterprises is, is absolutely essential to deliver mm -hmm. you know, the digital first experience yeah. mm -hmm. so very just very very different situations um, and you know you can be very successful in both environments um, but the approaches, at least, in, um, seem to be quite different from. from mm -hmm. those mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so on, on the enterprise piece, I absolutely agree in terms of what I've seen in terms of those that multi-year focus, but as well being able to demonstrate a quarter-to-quarter -quarter advancement, right? Mm -hmm. Public companies live quarter-to-quarter, -quarter, right? So being able to understand that that's an important context of what you're living in, and being able to fit into that. So I've, absolutely. And then something else that I saw the other day, just talking a little bit more about the small companies and their ability to actually, you know, create these omni-channel. I saw a chart that talked about Airbnb and when they first started, and the idea that they basically they only created two new, from scratch development pieces to their, you know, ecosystem. The rest was just connect, you know, a bunch of things that they brought together to create this uh, service. And I think that that's the model, right? In terms of if you can do a really good job with that, you know, thinking about what are the right pieces, how do they fit together, where is there a gap, right, that isn't uh, closed by something that's out there, and then just designing for that, then you've got something. So mm -hmm. Airbnb was able to scale really quickly, right? You think about how they, because they were just turning things on, right, and growing and growing and growing fast over time. So that's something that I always stood with me, right, in terms of thinking about a startup that was thinking, but they also thought long term, which I think is the piece there in terms of like this is where we want to get to. Let's start to decide what the ecosystem needs to look like, you know, decide what the pieces are, put them in place, and then we can grow, right? And we can get there over time and we can get there quickly. So I think maybe there's actually a bit of an alignment in terms of successful companies or small companies that scale and large enterprises, right? That are able to actually evolve with the time in terms of being able to think out a little bit to not just what's happening today at the moment, right? But being able to think, uh, and you know, I'm not sure what the time frame is, let's say a year or two years, whatever, right? So that they can actually start to put things in place, right? So that they can scale and get to the next level. And they're not always, you know, in emergency fixed mode because things are broken, right? All the time and customers are getting dissatisfied and then therefore they're losing users, which in a startup world, you know, users and attracting users is a big piece, right? For for their success. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Just to key off a couple of comments uh, that you made there, because I, I think that's absolutely correct. I mean, the um, the importance of prioritization, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. Context doesn't matter. <laughs> it's the ability to define a target state and rigorously yeah. prioritize what you are yeah. like. Identify, define a target state, identify the gaps, yeah. um, prioritize and service to business priorities and deliver the mm -hmm. value, I, I think transcends any industry, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, any any company size um, does not does not matter either. Um, yeah. yeah, there's a, it's, 
if I think about some of the uh, you know commonalities and some of the you know the evolution that I've seen over the last you know, five years, um, I think I think it's the like the 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 delivery model I think has become um, more clear. You know, I, I think that um, defining the target state and then setting up a program, right, mm -hmm. um, to be able to deliver the capabilities required. Um, to me, the the maturity of a scaled agile framework has really started to provide a blueprint blueprint for success. Mm -hmm. right? I just think about um, you know, earlier on in my career, you, you had these large, large, large programs and projects. Um, and it just struck me that the um, the stand up and the wind down was was um, a lot of perhaps low value add activities, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's just a high tax to pay. You know, you start a project, mm -hmm. you define the business requirements, you stand it up, you deliver it, and you wind it down, and then you repeat. That's a very, very, very high tax, right? Mm -hmm. you just think about the typical teaming, storming, norming, forming, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. um, and I think what what I've seen in you know the scaled agile framework is that now it is more, far more of a value stream approach, right? So what you do is you identify, um, you know, certainly you need your target state, but then you identify what is the focus of this particular delivery organization and how are they going to work with the various other teams that provide inputs uh, into that uh, value stream, and then you stand up once. Stand it up and standing it up is not easy, right? Um, but you form once and then you norm and then you perform. And once you've achieved that perform state, then it's just a matter of ingesting different capabilities into an already highly functioning team, right? Um, and that has been, um, that has been, I think, at least in the enterprise context, a, a huge evolution in the last couple of years. Just to that now that there is a blueprint, now that there is a model for success. Um, it's quite clear, it, you know. It's quite clear how to stand it up and how to run it, at least theoretically, right? You know, there is that blueprint. Um, certainly, a, you know, I think one of the interesting themes, which you know, if we get a chance to talk about, it, is is just the war for talent, right? You think about it, now that it is quite clear on how to get this done. Now, all of the skill sets around this, whether it be data analytics or marketing technology or, you know, scrum master, uh, agile delivery engineers, all of these skills are in absolutely high demand. And it's interesting that, you know, COVID has really kind of poured some gas on that fire now that the um, geographical boundaries have come down now that you know, at least in the Toronto context, Toronto is identified as a kind of a key talent market for multinationals. Um, you really kind of see this emergence of data analytics, AI, with the technology coming together with digital, mm -hmm. really creating this. It's it's a it's becoming abundantly clear from a business strategy perspective. You know, mm -hmm. where companies need to go. It's it's clear on the delivery model how mm -hmm. how to get there. Um, and then, so this entire ecosystem is really a really exciting space of mm -hmm. um, just anybody attached to this. I'm sure you see it within your company, uh, but mm -hmm. any, certainly I see it at ours. But anybody attached to this is frankly having a lot of fun, but also just in this incredibly high demand, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's a good place to be. It's a very interesting time, I think. Certainly in my career, I've never seen anything like it. I've really never yeah. seen um, just the intensity of of activity that, that we're yeah. seeing in uh, this space. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to talk a little bit more, just a, a couple of things there. You, like, you, you had so much there, but I want to talk a little bit more a couple of things. So one thing you talked about, just the tax, right? Of trying to, like, get stuff going, right? So going through an agile and being able to work in a more agile format with, like, and, and I believe what you're saying there is what, like, the teams of people with the right types of skills who can go and deal with something, Right. And then kind of give it back to the business, I guess, and then move on to the next one. So you always have that team, right, with the right skill sets and capabilities who are performing and executing and doing things for the business in a variety of places to help you go on. Mostly, I think, mm -hmm. um, except for the hand back, 
I think okay. that it's probably not that transactional, I think, mm -hmm. right? It's probably mm -hmm. more of a, and actually reaching back to kind of how we got to know one another just on service design. It's interesting to mm -hmm. see some of those um, themes, some of those principles inject themselves mm -hmm. into um, mm -hmm. agile delivery, right? Mm -hmm. Prototyping, mm -hmm. iteration, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. demonstrated scale, right? Mm -hmm. um, in, into the delivery model. And then perhaps this is more recent into how the business operates as well. Mm -hmm. I think it's kind of those, those service design concepts are now, I think, quite mature within mm -hmm. agile delivery, mm -hmm. but increasingly getting injected into the actual upstream business teams. And that's like, very mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. and it's, and you're starting to see how agile business teams start to mm. interact with agile delivery. And that is, that that's like very, very, very interesting to me. Right. And, um, Cause now you're getting to kind of where we always wanted to get to, right. Which is mm. like, okay. So the business is coming up with these um, ideas, test and learn, kind of try something mm -hmm. at scale. And now mm. the, you know, the technology teams can work together in a digital first mm. approach and, 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 and try things, right? Mm -hmm. You know, be mm -hmm. dynamic, be agile, um, mm -hmm. and 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 that interaction is quite interesting because you're now you're seeing that that test and learn that velocity is starting to line up for the first time, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it, it it is quite interesting to see it come together and to see mm -hmm. that technology, the speed of technology is now lining up with the speed of business. Um, mm -hmm. so. So yeah, yeah, I think we're we're definitely kind of in a place right now where, um, at least in the enterprise context, right? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's inspired by a lot of what startups have been doing perhaps for several years, but um, but in the enterprise context, I'm seeing that a real increase in our ability to our velocity, effectively. Yeah, yeah. So that just that infusion of that culture of test and learn, right? Let's make sure that we understand as an organization how to do that have the capabilities within our people, right? Not just in a center of excellence, but within our people so that right. we can have these experiments ongoing. And when experiment looks like it's successful, we can put energy behind it, right? And commit and come back, coming back to that whole idea of prioritization, right? When we feel it's time, we can prioritize it and keep moving it, right? So that it can scale. Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. That certainly was true, I would say. And I'm sure in many contexts continues to be true. Um, I view the migration to the cloud as the silo buster, right? Um, and every single large organization I know is in one stage or another of migrating all of their data assets to a cloud based environment. So, and the way that that's successful is, you know, it, it only ever makes sense to have one central repository, right? And then you can have um, other capabilities built upon that. You know, you might have a data lake and a data warehouse and, and so forth, um, a data analytics environment for data science. But all of this is kind of keyed off of that same uh, single uh, repository. So I, I think that um, there is, a, a journey happening right now, which is, um, you know, you know, every, you kind of often read about cloud, but you probably don't you know companies are front and center about where they are in their journey. It's just, it's not something that ever gets picked up or, or divulged. So, but I, I do believe that that is the true silo buster because now for the first time you're getting the data, all the data assets in one place that can be consumed by any business team. Right, with the appropriate controls, of course, privacy, uh, security controls, um, but can be, if it makes sense and is appropriate in, in a you know, privacy uh, forward um, approach, then business, different business teams can access data. So those, those barriers to data, the barriers to run analytics um, have all come down, right? So I, I do think that, you know, this is happening in enterprise today for sure. In startups, of you, you, you start a startup, you, you start cloud, um, and it's going to trickle down to SMBs over the course of the next five years, right? I think many companies are realizing that it's just so much more um, effective, uh, straightforward, cost-effective to be able to operate in a full cloud native environment. Um, 
that's just one comment on kind of the data silos. And, and I think we're seeing some really, really, really um, positive trends there. Yeah, I don't think I don't think it's everywhere. Um, like at every company, I, th- I think it's mm-hmm. going to be a significant amount of change management. You're you're absolutely right, Josh. Um, but I do see that um, you know success begets success, right? <laughs> so, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I have seen it work well. Cool. The other piece I wanted to talk about is just this, this idea of like the cloud being like the silo busters, and I love it. Like I haven't actually heard it framed that way. But that's one of the reasons we started to impact signal because we said, hey, as we move towards the cloud, there's going to be more opportunities to do things with analytics that we couldn't do before to help us design better service experiences that we would want to develop for the future. So, so I'm going to take that, John. I'm telling you right now, I'm going to use it in the future in terms of like, you know, the cloud just being those silo busters because that's what I've seen. That's what we've done in the past, and that's what I've seen. And mm-hmm. The other piece on it that I'll just add, right, which maybe, you know, add to the conversation is that for those small and medium businesses, they're going to be able to really take advantage of all of the work that's being done around how do you connect these different types of data sets? How do you cleanse them? How do you analyze them? How do you understand it to actually make decisions for your customers? So Google, AWS, all these companies are now in the business of actually selling that knowledge, right, out to small and medium businesses. So they now will have a cost to implement some of these new marketing technologies and things like that, that would be a lot lower. So I think you're just going to see the evolution of capabilities continue to grow and grow and grow because of that, because we're going to cloud, because we're getting new ways of analyzing data. Now we can do new things that we couldn't do before. So that would be the other thing that I would add that I've seen in my experiences over the last year or two. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, on that point, um, so fascinating to see um, and as a consumer so rewarding to see privacy at the fore now mm-hmm. and, you know you think mm-hmm. about what what Apple is doing and uh, mm-hmm. Google is doing mm-hmm. um, and I think as a consumer it just feels like um, the the privacy conversation had, has reached the right level where mm-hmm. you see very active changes within mm-hmm. some of the key players in the market um, mm-hmm. to be, I think, privacy forward, right? And it started to become a reason to buy, mm-hmm. you know, for mm-hmm. more people, I will say. Mm-hmm. And I think how that, you know, that even, you know, the government is, um, you know, starting to contemplate some, in Canada anyhow, some, some very significant and important changes to privacy legislation. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, I look at that as a data and, and analytics professional as, a really important moment, right? I, mm-hmm. think this, I think this is really important where, um, you know, we are entrusted with uh, customer data. And mm-hmm. uh, I think it's, you know, um, we need to make sure that we honor and respect that trust as mm-hmm. companies, mm-hmm. right? And um, to the extent that there are very, very clear kind of guidelines from government and that, that leaders, you um, you know, across the technology industry, Apple and Google and, and others mm-hmm. really to start to make very visible and public stances mm-hmm. uh, on privacy. I think that'll be very, 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 very interesting. Um, and mm-hmm. I think it'll spawn a whole um, industry, frankly, of getting deeper into understanding AI and mm-hmm. responsible AI and, mm-hmm. you know, how AI needs to adapt to the specific privacy um, preferences of individuals, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's going to be very, very interesting over the course of the next kind of five years, right? Um, Absolutely. I I also think that there's going to be a whole another industry in terms of allowing people to start to communicate what their preferences are, right? So that you know I'm comfortable with this, but I'm not comfortable with that. Exactly. And then you know once we have that information, then you know, that will be, I think that will, open, so I think that there's pieces around getting that information and how is that going to happen. I think there's a whole industry around that in terms of setting that up that's going to start. I think there's the next piece about now once we have that information, what can we now do for the future, right? Now that we have that type of clear communication and acceptance, because that's that doesn't happen right now. You know, people do a bunch of things and they're not totally aware of 
the information that's flowing out about themselves, for example. And but in the future, when I I believe that that becomes something that people consciously make choices around, that will open up even more interesting things for the future. Yeah, yeah. You think it's interesting to track kind of the key. <laughs> challenges and, and, and trends, right? So omni-channel is a key challenge and trend, and that actually got a lot more straightforward to be able to deliver seamless experiences across channels. And then Josh, you keyed in on, you know, data and data silos and the ability to bring, you know, data together to be able mm -hmm. to um, deliver that seamless experience. And now that's got a lot easier. Mm -hmm. and, and now it's getting into privacy and privacy preferences and understanding a specific individual's preferences and the ability to action upon that and to be able to mm -hmm. deliver the experience and service to those uh, preferences. That is in some ways the new frontier, right? Like how mm -hmm. do you cross mm -hmm. a large enterprise, take those preferences and push them all the way across, right? Um, mm -hmm. Whether they be communication preferences or data preferences or whatever they might be. Um, and I'm, yeah, I think that is going to be a very interesting journey over the course of the next three, five years is just mm -hmm. to make sure that we can deliver against mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, if you're kind of taking me back to, you know, like a day one, right? So you're in a new role and you believe that you understand the mandate of the new role and where do you get started, uh, that kind of uh, situation. Yeah. And I think the probably the most important thing, if, and it's kind of going back to basics, right? So you go back and you understand, okay, do, you, do we have clarity on the business priorities? That's, I think, the first uh, question that we have to ask ourselves is do we understand clearly what the business priorities are um, and then we can take that forward and once we understand the business priorities do we have a, a clear roadmap to get there is it, is it abundantly clear of okay business priorities are this therefore we should do this and if that's not abundantly clear, um, then that's probably the most important thing, right? Is okay. So business priorities are X, and therefore this implies these. Let's call them use cases. Um, these use cases need to be delivered. Now, once you have an understanding of what the use cases are, then you can get into the how, right? And I, I think that um, that how there are so many ways of doing it, right? Um, and I think an honest assessment of internal capabilities you know is this something that we can take upon ourselves do we need help where are those gaps um, but if we understand the business priorities and we understand the use cases of what needs to be done that's a very 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 important starting point because then you can get into acquiring the talent building the team setting up the delivery model to be able to execute against the business priorities. Um, but it all starts with understanding what those business priorities are and what the use cases are in service to those business priorities. So I'd say that's the most important thing to start um, and, you know, probably get help as needed. I think, um, you know, certainly in my experience that that very beginning is the right time to get some help. Um, you know, I think there's that, that kind of feels like the mountain and the quicker that you can get to the top of that mountain, the quicker you can start delivering value. So, you know, get the help, build the team, um, you know, get established in terms of a, of a delivery model and start delivering value. There's probably six months of a window, right, where you have to kind of come out the other side and have tangible results. Um, it's not 12, might be nine, depending on the situation. <laughs> right? I think that's really important is you have to design a plan to be able to deliver value within six months. And it needs to be tangible value, right? Um, which takes you down a very clear path. Actually, there's like a clarifying path of, okay, there's only, I can't take on huge things. I need to pick lower hanging fruits and be able to execute against that. And actually your delivery against that lower hanging fruit, those easy to, easier to deliver use cases, then unlocks the next tranche of investment. When you have the next tranche of investment, then you can get into more transformational change, right? And it's really important that once we get that flywheel spinning and to deliver the signals, sorry, sing, sing, singles, <laughs> in, so to allow you to hit some triples and all yeah. that. That's kind of it. It's been my experience. Well, I would say it's both, actually. It's a single, 
but it's also a signal, right? You're signaling to the organization there you go. that things can get done. <laughs> <laughs> Made that work. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Chad, we're like one minute, so I think we'll, we'll wrap it there. I think that was great. I don't actually have anything that I would add, uh, you know, that's different than that. I think, you know, exactly what you said about, you know, really being clear in terms of those steps that are important. So I just wanted to just take the last minute just to thank you.